Our guest speaker tonight, Professor William Maxwell, was born in Center Point, Arkansas, between Nashville and DeQueen. I'm not going to detail the fact that he graduated at the top of his doctoral class at Harvard, as evidenced by being elected to the Phi, Delta Kappa, Phi Delta Kappa Honor Society. Nor will I mention what he has learned from researching and lecturing in over 60 nations on all continents since 1954, 65 years ago. Instead, I'm going to explain Professor Maxwell's miraculous epiphany, which qualifies him to be listened to with special attention. It is also noteworthy that Professor Maxwell is one of only two professors of thinking in the entire world. The date, November 12, 2014, near Atlanta. After a world tour speaking to the largest Christian church in Europe, in Kent, England, speaking at the top techn technological university in Africa, in Nigeria, and visiting Japan and Malaysia, it was 6 a.m. Professor Maxwell was showering in an eight foot by eight foot hotel shower room when he slipped and fell backwards and could not reach out to a wall to break his fall. He lost consciousness. After he regained consciousness, he discovered that he could not lift his body one inch. Any movement was as if a red hot knife was stabbing down his neck and spine. He could not, he could just lift his arms a bit and his legs a small amount, but any other movement was like torture. His voice was almost gone. He fell back into unconsciousness several times. He tried to scream for help, no one could hear him. Then while unconscious, he heard an unfamiliar and authoritative voice. William, you better call 911 or you will die. He woke up and tried to move, but could not. He fell back into unconsciousness. The next time he awakened, he was out of the shower room, across the bed, lying diagonally, face up, buck naked in his very high bed. He could not turn or reach the telephone. He didn't remember where the telephone was. Finally, ignoring the excruciating pains, he felt to his right, then his left, and found the phone, pulled it to his chest, and dialed zero. The operator finally answered. He said to her, help, I can't move. There was a long silence. Then the operator said, please take the chain off the door. I can't move, he said. Cut the chain. I don't have anything to cut the chain with, she said. Help, please call 911. I'm in great pain, he said, as he fell back into unconsciousness. Sometime later, he awakened to see three tall, strong men moving from the window toward his bed. At the hospital, the doctor told him that his vertebrae numbers four and five had been broken. Six hours of surgery mended his spinal column with three long bolts and 12 small screws. The pains went beyond the power of any painkillers. So he begged God to let him die. His pain took him to hell where he saw many sorts of frightful creatures. Finally, the pain abated, and he heard again that commanding voice. William, you were saved to preach to parents everywhere that their children are potential geniuses. At age 90, Professor Maxwell is trying to obey a voice from heaven. Please, listen to him. He is uniquely qualified to be listened to. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mrs. Batts. You have gathered around you the creme de la creme, and uh, you can sense it. 
in this room. We humans have been taught to think of ourselves as powerless. Wrong. We have great power. Particularly when aided by the will of God. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to kind of try to open a window to the future for the grandparents and the parents and the children and the grandchildren and the babies. I understand there may be two or three little babies somewhere around here. Welcome all. Mrs. Betts, this is a wonderful meeting. It's my honor to be a part of your efforts. Let me tell a little bit about Mrs. Bat, just a sentence or two. In Persia, about 150, 180 years ago, there was a story told. All humans move all the time. <laughs> you know, we humans have never stayed in place, but this story was for everybody. When you go into a city, there is always a wise man there. Find him and become a little wiser. There's always a lady there. That lady typically has a mother figure. She's nurturing, protective, and fascinatingly, she acquaints you with your history. I've not been, I've been into every major city in this country, I think. I'm almost certain. I don't remember going into a city realizing that some lady had decided to take upon her shoulders the task of teaching our children what their past was like so that they can make our future brighter and better. Mrs. Batts done, has done that. We need more such ladies everywhere in our world. Pray for her that she may be an example to every city and village in this country and in the world. Thank you, Mrs. Betts. I want to tell you two research projects that I happen to luck upon. And that will illustrate what I'm going to do with these little kids. They play a couple of games in a moment. The year is 1957. Does anybody remember what happened in October 1957 in space? Anybody remember? What? Anybody? The Russians put up Sputnik, October 1957, and our nation panicked. Because if they can get a satellite up there in space, they can let it fall down upon the Earth with atom bombs. We panicked. I'm in the 7th Infantry Division in Korea, South Korea, just north of Seoul, just south of the DMZ. I'm the education officer for 1,500 U.S. soldiers. Uh, the, every soldier in Korea had to go to school at night if they didn't have a degree or if they didn't have the high school diploma. So I'm hired by the Army to make sure that these soldiers get a good civilian education. That's my job. <laughs> but on my desk one morning, there was a list of soldiers in Korea, all Korea, who have an IQ over 142. These were all geniuses. How it got there, no one put it. it was, uh, there was an open letter with a list. I read it. I was shocked. We had 50,000 soldiers in Korea at the time, and 142 of them were measured at an IQ over 142. So I went to my colonel, a colonel, full colonel, G1, the Eagle Colonel. <laughs> and he was from Mississippi. And if I'm not in the officers club, when he referred to black people, it would be with the N word. He had all the qualities of the typical Southern whatever. Colonel, I said, I just got a list of soldiers in Korea who are geniuses. I want to go study them. He looked at me and said, what do you need? I need helicopters. They're up in the mountaintops. I need jeeps on the weekend. I need plane, a train tickets to Pusan, etc." You got it. It took him 10 seconds to give me everything I needed to, for a year 
knock on those doors and study those 142 geniuses in Korea. Guess what my final answer was, for final question was? Has anyone ever told you that you are a genius? Guess how many answered yes? Not one American soldier with an IQ of 142 had ever been told by anybody that they were geniuses. This was shocking to me. Something is wrong with a culture that doesn't tell people you're a possible genius. I published it in Phi Delta Kappa. It's there. And if you could Google it, Phi Delta Kappa, uh, William Maxwell, some purposes and means of army education, it's there. Guess what race they were? All white. Not one, Mac, not one Mexican, not one black, not one Indian. All white. Guess what part of the country they were from? The South. Guess what economic class they were in? The poor. The very poor. Because the upper class, they're sent off to Exeter somewhere right away. Well, this told me we blacks could complain of poor education. But guess what? We're not the only ones who get an inadequate education. In fact, American children as a whole, age 15, how old are you? 13? 11? Woo, you're a big boy. <laughs> Anyway, the average American 15-year-old ranks behind Switzerland, S Singapore, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, China, behind Slovenia, number 35 in the world. You're not going to compete in a technological world if your mathematical knowledge is behind Slovenia. So we have a real problem in our culture that we are refuse to look for geniuses when they are able to be found, like at this age, four, five. <laughs> geniuses blossom between two and a half and eight. There's a Japanese brain scientist named Kubota. You've seen Kubota all over the place, different family. This guy, Kubota, Kisou Kubota, is a brain scientist at Kyoto University, world's top brain scientist. He just discovered in the last five years, at age five months, the baby's brain awakens and can learn almost anything. It's amazing little sponge with 86 billion brain cells ready to go to work. We look for geniuses beginning at eight months. That was my first experience in, in, as a researcher. My next one was, my wife, I married my wife in Tokyo, but she's American. And she was raving about the beauty and lovely people of the South Pacific. So one day I'm reading the New York Times and there's an ad for a professor, no, a, re, a, a senior lecturer at the University of the South Pacific. So I wrote them a letter saying, What's this about? Something like that. I wasn't applying, just wanted to know more. And they wrote, it back, wrote me back and said, well, we're going to offer you a readership in education if you want to come down to the South Pacific. I said, okay, I'll come down and take a look. I flew down and I liked what I saw, as you will. They just, this couple over here just had spent their 50th wed, uh, wedding anniversary. I, I recommended to them, but they didn't listen to me. Go to Fiji. It's much better. <laughs> They went to Mexico. But on your 50th, on your, how old are you? 14, 13? 11. I can't get that into my head. Anyway, when you get to be 50 and you take your wife on a honeymoon, go to Fiji. Anyway, I go and they up the bid to being a full professor. And my wife and I went there. Not one person in the entire university from the South Pacific had a research degree. This is 1977. I panic. What the hell is going on? Nobody here from the South Pacific has a research degree. So I got busy. 
and I called a conference on thinking. I did all kinds of things, but mainly I made my students go out and do some research, looking for geniuses at age six. And their, their research was published along with mine. And guess what we did? Every one of them raised the IQ of these six-year-old children. It was 484, I think it was, altogether. Every year, for four years, raised the IQ by an average of 11 points. Every kid that they coach raised the IQ to at least, at least six, average 11. The top, pri top reach was age, thanks was eight, uh, IQ gain of 19 points. Year after year after year, my students in the South Pacific, from Solomon Islands, Tonga, Samoa, Vanuatu, all over the South Pacific, they were able to raise the IQ of children at least six points in one semester. So I'm gonna begin with the oldest kids. Anybody 15 years old, 15 years? 14? Anybody 14, 13? Come up here, please. Anybody 13, 12? You're 12? No. no. <laughs> 11? You come on over. How old are you? Come on. If you're willing, you can, I'm not forcing you. Anybody else, 11, 12, 13? Okay. Teacher, what are some of the easiest talents to find? Any teacher. What's the easiest talents to look for? Yes. And? Communication. Communication skills, yes. Athletic skills. So we got to do this one. All good boys. Do you think you'd be a good athlete? Maybe. How about you? No, how about, no, I bet you can be. Now let's see, stand here, just stand there. Now what do athletes have that a lot of that other people have just a modest amount of? Height, Height weight, strength, balance. You can tell an athlete in two seconds if they have a sense of balance. So let's check your balance. Now how are we gonna check your balance? You're going to lift one foot. Can I show, use your shoulder? You're going to lift one foot and just hold it there and don't fall down. That's the best test of balance. So on this, we'll see if you can go to 20 seconds. You're an absolute genius. So let's see. By the way, this was discovered by Suzuki for music. And I'll ask my musician, Mr. Marcellus, where is he? Mr. Marcellus, I might ask you to give a music test in a minute. I'll explain. It's so easy. <laughs> okay, let's see. This test is simple. You can check it out with all your buddies. You say you're not an athlete. Go to your school and find one, for heaven's sakes, <laughs> because we need more good athletes who are moral and who obey the law and so on. All right, on your mark, you can raise your right leg where the knee is horizontal. Horizontal. Can you make it horizontal? Let's see. Yes. All right. On your mark, down. On your mark, get set, ready, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, <laughs> twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20. Come here. Now, when you see this boy on the street at Walmart, you tell him he doesn't think of himself as an athlete, but he could be with training. Because today he can do 20. Guess how many he can do tomorrow? 21. Guess how many he can do Thursday or Friday? 22. He can just increase it one a day, and pretty soon you can do a thousand. You believe me? Wow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Where are the little ones? The four, five, six-year-olds. Come on. All right, now line up this way. Face your parents. Come on, come on. You're seven. That's okay. You can play. Okay, I'm going to count by numbers, Mr. Athlete. I'm going to count, and you're going to continue my sentence. One, two, three, uh, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Guess. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yes. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <clears throat> now, can you do it? Let's hear. One. Two. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven. Ten, eleven. Perfect, almost. Let's see if you can do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes. <laughs> now let me see. A, B, C. What? A, B, C, what? Oh, oh one, two, two three, three, four, four five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Give this kid a genius kid. <laughs> now, what can you do? Do some numbers? Let's hear. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> we did the research. When dads spend seven minutes a day, is your kid worth seven minutes a day? Mm -hmm. Guess how many fathers in this country spend seven minutes a day with their children? Almost nobody. <laughs> And we are sinking as a culture because the mothers are doing their job, typically. It's us fathers who are falling down on the job. We need seven minutes a day with our children, teaching them not only arithmetic and everything else. Thank you, boys and girls. So I'm going to find out which of you may be a future mathematician. Because the world needs mathematics. I have a number. If I add 2 to this number, I get 10. What number do I have? Six. Eight. 8. You don't have to, don't raise your hand, just shout it out. I have a number. If I subtract 2, I get 10. 12. 12. I have a number. If I multiply by 3, I get 30. Ten. Yes, who said 10? I said it. All right. I have a number. If I add 10, I get 11. One. Yes. Now, notice it takes the brain a little while to wake up. That's the dad's job to wake those kids up. <laughs> you agree? Okay. I have a number. I multiply this number by 5, I get 40. 8. I have a number. I multiply this number by 7, I get 49. Did you say it? I didn't hear you. Did you say it too? I have a number. I multiply this number by 7 and add 1. I get 50. Seven, yes. What is your last name, Martinez? In schools, in the old days, children used to recite a lot. So they'd get used to being on the, 
on the mat, so to speak. I take it that Martinez is rarely called upon in class. Do they ever call on you? Do they? Good. I have a number. I multiply by two. I get 26. What number do I have? Yes. I have another number, and this is the last one. I subtract 12, and I get minus one. Hmm? 11 is right. Now, sometimes it takes a long time to find talent. Sometimes you can find talent, Suzuki says, in three minutes or less. Let's look for talent. That's a charge to all of us. And when we find it, tell the kid. Thank you. Give me my cards back, please. <laughs> Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. At age six in Center Point, Arkansas, I was given a nickname professor. At age six, Center Point High School. 20 years later, exactly, I am a professor in Kwangju, Korea. It was, I didn't realize until much later that Mr. Ingram, the principal, had practiced self-fulfilling prophecy on me. <laughs> but research by Robert Rosenthal at Harvard reveals the validity of that. If we say to this child, you know, you look sick, really sick, I think you'll be very ill pretty soon. Guess what happens to that child? She gets sick. Uh, conversely, if we say to this boy, hey, you know, you ought to be in Hollywood. You're so good looking. You ought to be in Hollywood. <laughs> guess, guess where he's going? <laughs> so I've made a little flyer to hand out. If you will help me pass it out, Reverend Stevenson. Thanks. That side. And, and would you help me pass it out on this side, Martinez? This is just a little primer on things that parents should now do that we didn't do before because times have changed. And we've got to find more geniuses because otherwise our civilization, like all other civilizations, is going to die. I have time for one question and I'll turn the program back over to Mrs. Betts. Any questions to me? Yes, sir. I taught in Korea. I was there 11 years altogether. Hanguk Malashinika? No. No. It's an easy language to learn. Yeah. Have you ever taught in uh, Japan? I never taught in Japan. I've visited there maybe 30 times. But I I've lectured there, but I've never been a professor there. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. My wife and I were married in Hakone on the Mount Fuji. And usually I visit Tokyo. And last visit. Oh, yes, yes, right nearby. My last visit, I was at the bottom of Japan, Kagoshima. It's the very bottom. The very best school in the world is probably there, Kagoshima. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you were saying earlier that some of the smartest people are from Korea. Yes. So what, um, what are their secrets? What, yes, what do their mothers and fathers do to incorporate that? Well, I'll tell you what they did. They were a poor country. They were poor than church mice when I went there. They had only 35 miles of paved highway in the entire country. Now they have super highways all over the place. Well, one of the things that Koreans do is when they get married, the first thing they do is buy an encyclopedia for the kids. Then they buy a piano, a violin. There's hardly a single Korean home that is without a musical instrument. Just like Germany 200 years ago. If you'd gone to Germany 200 years ago, every middle class home and upper would have a piano and other instruments. And that's why Germany was the world's leader in all the sciences up until Hitler. For 200 years, Germany led the world in the sciences because 
they all studied music. Music does a wonderful thing to the brain. So Mrs. Betts, thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.